I don't think there's any question today that there are secret governments. It's clear that there has been an organized effort to discredit every aspect of the UFO phenomenon. The UFO cover-up began uh, with legitimate national security concerns. When you're dealing with the military, especially in, in matters of secrecy, the idea is to deceive. Two, one. It's likely that we're going to find out for sure whether this Roswell event happened or not. How on earth would you keep a secret like that so long? Almost 60 years after Roswell, the mystery of what crashed in the deserts of New Mexico remains a secret. The government's official stance about the existence of UFOs has always been denial. Eyewitnesses have come and gone. Project Blue Book, the UFO study program of the U.S. Air Force, has gone out of business. But many questions remain. Researchers and private investigators continue to follow every lead in hopes that someday the truth will be revealed. Newly leaked classified government documents may be the first real evidence to shed light on this never-ending story. I decided that instead of looking at photographs or instead of trying to sort out new witness testimony, that it'd be better to try a different approach, which was the approach of, of authenticating documents. Dating from the 1940s and 1950s, these documents refer to extraterrestrial contact and the secret operation established to investigate this phenomenon. This project was led by a group of men appointed by executive order. They operated under the code name Majestic 12, or simply MJ-12. If it is true, that the United States government has pursued a, a very aggressive but deeply clandestine effort to collect and contain information about UFO phenomena, including crashes, military encounters, and whatnot. It is absolutely essential that there be documents about that effort and when I look at the MJ-12 documents, I say to myself, these are the kinds of documents a person would expect to see. This kind of document has to exist. It is the unanimous opinion of the members that Operation Majestic 12 be a fully funded, operational, top secret research and development intelligence gathering agency. It is also recommended that a panel of experts be appointed to chair and oversee the functions and operations of said agency. Its members should have appropriate security clearances. What impresses me most about these documents is all these checkable details. We got so many names to check out, so many dates, and so many places. We'll be at this for the next couple of years, but so far it looks impressive that these things are checking out to be true, real, and authentic. A major objection to all the documents is that we don't know who provided them. We have to consider, of course, that whoever did was violating the law and would be subject to enormous penalties for photographing classified documents and giving them to people who don't have any authorization to receive them. It began in 1988 when I began filing Freedom of Information Act requests to the government for any information on UFOs. And then in October 1992, I went to the post office and I pulled out a Time magazine that had a document inserted in it, and I just thought it was a prank. I was working my shift as a security officer at Pine Knot Landing. An old gentleman came to the gate and I said, well, I'm Thomas Cantwell. He told me he was in the Army's Counterintelligence Interplanetary Phenomenon Unit since 1942 and have been involved in the UFO program almost into the 1980s. And he just wanted to let me know that he was real, to tell me everything, get it off his chest, because he didn't think he had much longer to live. The IPU stands for the Interplanetary Phenomenon Unit, and this is rumored to have been a unit within the Army 
uh, late 40s, early 50s. Uh, some people link the uh, late Douglas MacArthur with this group, that they were involved in some kind of early UFO investigation. My father himself had been involved in the United States Air Force's UFO program for several years. I also learned uh, after my father's death by going through his papers that uh, he was awarded the Air Force Commendation Medal and was given a special citation uh, by order of General LeMay for his outstanding work in the United States Air Force UFO program. It's very clear to me that UFOs are real. The data that we have in hand establishes that beyond a shadow of a doubt to my mind. And that some of them certainly uh, are involved observations of alien spacecraft. This is a completely independent question from whether or not the MJ-12 documents are real themselves and are valid. I had no interest or beliefs in UFOs and I never considered giving any thought to the phenomenon itself. But when your own father tells you they're real, and that the Air Force considered them very threatening to the United States Air Force, then I began to have a different attitude. The documents that Tim Cooper had were really uh, very extensive. There were 100 pages, 50,000 words. The things that they talk about, however, are, are stunning. A consensus reached by members of the panel that until positive proof that the Russians did not attempt a series of reconnaissance flights over our most secure installations, the sightings and recovered objects are interplanetary in nature. Buried in one of these MJ-12 documents is the White Hot Report. It is a reference to a discovery in 1941. This alludes to the possibility that a UFO crashed in the United States six years before the Roswell event. I originally read the first account, at least that I'm aware of, the only real account uh, of the Cape Girardeau 1941 crash retrieval event in Leonard Stringfield's 1991 volume about crash saucers. And I didn't think a lot about it until one of these newer MJ-12 documents mentioned the crash in Missouri. And I decided I was going to find Charlotte Mann. Grandfather had been called out that someone had called in that there had been a plane crash outside of town. And would he be willing to go to minister to people there, which he did. Upon arriving, it was a very different situation. It was not, not a conventional aircraft as we know it. There were three entities or non-human um, people there. Two were just outside the saucer, and a third one was further out. His understanding was that perhaps that third one was not dead on impact. So Father did pray over them, give them last rites. Not long after they arrived, military just showed up. I surrounded the area. Grandfather didn't know what was said to the others, but he was told, this didn't happen, you didn't see this, this is national security, it is never to be talked about again. The year following the Cape Girardeau report, Los Angeles was the site of more UFO activity. The LA air raid allegedly produced two more downed saucers, one just off the coast of California. The Army Air Corps also recovered a similar object in the San Bernardino Mountains, east of Los Angeles, which cannot be identified as conventional aircraft. This headquarters has come to a determination that the mystery airplanes are in fact not earthly, and according to secret intelligence sources, they are in all probability of interplanetary origin. With the United States at war, it appears that President Roosevelt saw this interplanetary phenomenon not as a threat, but as a great opportunity. I have considered the disposition of the material in possession of the army that may be of great significance toward the development of a super weapon of war. A new super weapon was developed to win the war. 
it was tested in remote areas of New Mexico and Nevada. Dr. Robert Oppenheimer led the top secret Manhattan Project that would change the world forever. This time round, stakes are kind of high. It's going to work all right, Robert. And I'm sure we'll never be sorry for it. Well, we'll know in 40 seconds. As the atom bomb experiments continued, so did the sightings of UFOs. Many believe that it was this nuclear testing that actually drew these mysterious objects to the area. The government's first official UFO program study showed that UFOs were very interested in things atomic, things that uh, generated plutonium. And our documents also show that. Specifically, there's one case where they talk about a crash site just a half a mile from the Trinity site, which is the first atomic test on the planet. This is the gallant crew that rode the big super fort which carried the first atomic bomb to Japan. Piloted by Colonel Paul Tibbetts, Jr. of Miami, carrying Navy Captain William Parsons of Chicago, who helped design the bomb as observer, and Major Thomas Ferraby of Moxville, North Carolina, who pulled the plug on Hiroshima, the B-29 dropped its load of atomic death, which exploded with a force equal to 20,000 tons of TNT. When the bomb was dropped on Japan in 1945, the war ended, but the UFO activity did not. In June of 1947, physicist Albert Einstein and nuclear scientist Robert Oppenheimer drafted a report offering their opinions on how to deal with extraterrestrial biological entities if they did indeed exist. It is difficult to predict what the attitude of international law will be with regard to the occupation by celestial peoples of certain locations on our planet. But the only thing that can be foreseen is that there will be a profound change in traditional concepts. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. Army officers say the missile found sometime last week has been inspected at Roswell, New Mexico and sent to Wright Field, Ohio for further inspection. When news of a crashed saucer near Roswell, New Mexico hit the airwaves, the government was ready. The saucer quickly became a downed weather balloon, and a policy of evasion became the order of the day. It would last for decades. I think the U.S. Air Force explanation that mogul balloons what crashed at Roswell is just specious. Uh, first of all, the timing is wrong. The technologies are wrong. Uh, certainly pieces of a mogul balloon or the sensor systems attached there too would have been identifiable, and they aren't. I believe that these kinds of answers actually do a disservice both to the American people and to the Air Force itself. I am here to discuss the so-called flying saucers. The Air Force interest in this problem has been due to our feeling of an obligation to identify and analyze to the best of our ability anything in the air that may have the possibility of threat or menace to the United States. In pursuit of this obligation since 1947, we have received and analyzed between one and 2,000 reports. We've been able to explain them as uh, hoaxes, as erroneously identified friendly aircraft, as meteorological or electronic phenomena or as light aberration. With all due respect to the Air Force, I believe that some of them will prove to be of interplanetary origin. During a three-year investigation, I found that many pilots have described objects of substance and high speed. One case, pilots reported their plane was buffeted by an object which passed them at 500 miles an hour. Obviously, this was a solid object, and I believe it was from outer space. I am certain that there have been several recoveries of alien craft and bodies in the United States. I'm using the word several advisedly, that it could be very conservative. Roswell was not the first incident. My feeling is that uh, the Missouri incident in 1941, as related by the Reverend William Huffman to his granddaughter, did indeed occur. 
I believe there's a cover-up on the UFO subject because so many different things point to it. Clear, well-documented reports from credible witnesses, a lot of documentary information from the archives, a pattern of denial from the government that looks almost silly, a pattern of denial from scientists that is clearly informed not by facts, but by some kind, I would say an indirect kind of intimidation. The reason I feel the Air Force and the government in general is trying to uh, destroy my father is so that they can destroy the Roswell event. Uh, that must mean that there really is something there that they have to hide, that this must be kept from the public at all costs. When you're dealing with the military, especially in, in matters of secrecy, the idea is to deceive. There is a manual, uh, as you well know, that I'm J-12, which also states to uh, discourage witnesses, to uh, put out false statements, to protect the secrecy of this 1947 event. One of the first documents that I got was entitled Extraterrestrial Entities and Technology Recovery and Disposal. The content of the Special Operations Manual is really quite stunning. It explains why it's so important to keep it secret and how they go about the process, how they keep the public in the dark, what lies they tell them, what deceptive statements. Great care must be taken to preserve the security of any location where extraterrestrial technology might be retrievable for scientific study. The most desirable response would be that nothing unusual has occurred. It may become necessary to issue false statements to preserve the security of the site. We continue to study the Special Operations Manual and look at each aspect of it and try to determine the authenticity of it. Subtleties like the use of the term central intelligence instead of central intelligence agency show a subtle amount of arrogance that is indicative of the central intelligence agency in 1954. The 32-page Special Operations Manual also includes the Extraterrestrial Technology Classification Table. It details procedures for retrieval of crashed saucers, how to handle organic matter, and where to ship the bodies. The Blue Lab at Wright Field in Ohio was the secret destination for some of this material. A young woman named June Crane worked in a classified office at the base shortly before she died. She told her story. I started at Wright Patterson in 42. I was 18 years old. And all of the people I worked with were older than me. So I'm probably the last survivor of my lab group and probably the last one still around to talk about it. I had a Q clearance. I worked with scientists and with engineers. I knew a man named Clarence Smith. He was a master sergeant. He came in one day before we started to work very upset. Clarence told us that his plane brought back two bodies in crates from New Mexico. When I asked which plane had crashed, he said, it wasn't a plane, it was a flying saucer. Well, they knew of three crashes that I was aware of by 1952. Maybe there were more. In 52, there was a crash cover-up. Roswell was in 47. That balloon story was a damn lie then, and it's still a lie. When I interviewed June, I realized that I was getting a rare glimpse into another period of time that was right at the heart of the mystery of ufology. I began to understand the full extent of the cover-up, the difference between what was commonly known to engineers and scientists and what is probably still known to this day and what has been revealed to the public. An officer showed me a piece of metal. I think that it was Lieutenant Rose. He was one of those guys in the office who liked to talk to me. Lieutenant Rose asked me to break it up, tear it apart if I could. He handed me the scissors. I couldn't dent it or cut it. I asked him what it was and where it came from. 
He said that it was a piece of a spaceship. According to the Special Operations Manual, the physical evidence from the crash was to be collected and transported to an undisclosed location for study. That location appears to have been the mysterious Area 51. I'm satisfied and very pleased that there is good reason to say that uh, Area 51 was created in the early 50s. Uh, now we have that reason. We didn't have that reason before. Skeptics have claimed that Area 51 did not exist when the Special Operations Manual was published in 1954. But according to this Las Vegas newspaper, a huge government installation began construction in the Nevada desert in early 1951. The project was cloaked in a security blackout and has remained so to this day. Many believe it is where the technology of these alien craft is being studied. It causes one to ask the question, and I don't know the answer, but to ask the question of to what extent might we have been successful in reverse engineering some of the discoveries from crashed flying saucers. Now that the sound barrier has been cracked, the thermal or heat barrier is the goal of the experimental X-2 rocket plane. The stainless steel bullet designed to stand speeds of more than 2,000 miles an hour is released. On these tests, the rocket plane is not fueled, but in future runs, when it attains maximum velocity, heat developed by friction may reach more than 1,000 degrees. Here, the ability of metal and alloys to withstand the heat are expected to provide valuable data for projected spaceships and satellites. The slim metal ship may furnish some of the answers as the world enters the space age. The Atomic Energy Commission and Nuclear Energy Propulsion of Aircraft are currently conducting research for advanced technologies in atomic engines and radical propulsion studies. Integration of hydrogen-based fuels and electro-hydrodynamic technology may open up for us development of super-aerodynes with Mach 5 capabilities. Some of the technology, yes, they have improved on or discovered and, and it's being used today. Yeah, I think everything that we were involved in from 1942 clear up to 1947 was, was justified. Just weeks after the crashes at Roswell, President Harry Truman named James V. Forrestal as the first Secretary of Defense. On September 24, 1947, a top secret research and development operation was established under his direction. It was called Majestic 12. It's my understanding that MJ-12 was basically a sort of oversight administrative policy-making group, very small and that the people who were responsible to MG-12 were very select people in various branches of the intelligence community, the military and military department. So it was very compartmented. It wasn't some huge operation. MJ-12 supervised several agencies involved in various aspects of the UFO phenomenon. But only the 12 Majestic members knew the whole story, and they reported only to the president on a need-to-know basis. One of the reasons that there are so few leaks is that nine out of ten people are loyal Americans when they sign a security oath and they are rigorously defending what they've agreed to. Namely, they're not going to tell anybody. And so therefore, really only one out of a thousand persons ever gets close to leaking the story. One of the most stunning documents that arrived in Tim Cooper's mailbox was the first annual report of the Majestic 12 operation. And this was a primary report and then three annexes comprising 17 pages. Many unusual commentaries were included. Everything from missing soldiers to airplanes that had been shot down while chasing UFOs. There's a section called Government Policy of Control and Denial. One of the most difficult aspects of controlling the perception in the public's mind of government attempts of denial and ignorance is actual control of the press. People ask, how on earth would you keep a secret like that for so long? And the way they did it was to begin with the security procedures that we developed during the Manhattan Engineering Project for the first atomic bomb. Compartmentalization to tell each group only a little bit of the story so hardly anybody has the big picture. 
And then, of course, security tests, security oaths, fines, and ultimately, threats. There's a section called Constitutional and Domestic Issues, and it states, In dealing with clear violations of civic law and guarantees as defined under the Constitution, it has been discussed among members of Majestic 12 that such protection of individual rights are outweighed by the nature of the threat. Clearly, they thought that ET's landing or being involved in the American citizenry was so important that they would control, capture, and manage every aspect of that interaction. It's a very interesting group of people. Six civilian, six military, two Air Force, two Army, two Navy. And some of, them were, some of them were very well known, but some of them weren't very well known, but turned out to be perfectly appropriate. As President-elect Dwight Eisenhower was preparing to take office, he was briefed about the ongoing UFO investigations of this elite group. I believe the Eisenhower briefing document is genuine. The list of members, I thought that would indicate it was phony because Dr. Donald Menzel, a Harvard University professor of astronomy, was listed as a member. But he was a total skeptic. He wrote three anti-UFO books. You certainly don't need a security clearance to teach astronomy at Harvard. First of all, the objects are not unidentified. We know what they are. Second, in many cases, in most cases, they're not flying. And finally, in many cases, they are not even material objects. I discovered, to my total amazement, that he led a double life, that he worked with the National Security Agency, worked with the CIA, had a top secret ultra clearance, did classified work for 30 companies. None of this was known. By the time Eisenhower read this above top secret document, the founder of the Majestic 12, James Forrestal, was dead. In March of 1949, he was diagnosed with depression and ordered to the Bethesda Naval Hospital. He was isolated and feared for his life. On May 22nd, his body was found below his hospital window. His death was ruled a suicide, but this CIA memo tells a different story. The untimely death of Secretary Forrestal was deemed necessary and regrettable. If it should ever be possible to prove that the documents are true, then obviously they indicate uh, a very, very different history than we thought. They indicate layers of government we don't know exist. They indicate procedures of government that seem anti-constitutional. They paint a picture of a world that is uh, wildly different than the average person expects. And of course also a world in which there are aliens flying around and being captured and studied by government forces. It's a very odd picture indeed. I'm convinced based upon the evidence that's building up that something uh, very strange has happened that the number of sightings of all types are just out of all proportion to uh, something that if it's not real there's something very very strange going on so it is the preponderance of evidence it is the um, old timers coming forward it is the documents that uh, bob and ryan wood are putting together that uh, with powerful forensic research make a very very powerful case it's hard to ignore we have selected the techniques that question document examiners use and we've hired some question document examiners and those techniques are very powerful because they permit a judge in a courtroom to tell the difference between a genuine document and a fake document the degrees of authenticity can be determined by comparison of the specialized stamps file numbers date formats, line spacing, and paragraphing with known authentic archival documents. File markings are often particularly telling. Some of the documents have misspelled words. Does this mean they're frauds? We don't think so. These originals are probably rough drafts, which would have typos and temporary spellings until the final draft was complete. One of the things that question document examiners do to authenticate documents is to look at the type and so when you study the typography and become familiar with how the hot lead printing presses of that era worked, you find that once every so often there was a letter Z that was raised because it was not commonly used. We found a document from that era that shows a raised Z. And we have in our own document 
about every third Z is raised. This is just exactly the kind of thing that telegraphs authenticity. If you're talking about leaked documents, the provenance of leaked documents, we need to know where they've come from. We need to see the originals. And one has to admit that in 99% of cases, we do not see the originals. We have several documents that are original pages. These permit testing that cannot be done with copies. For example, we can date a document by analyzing its ink. A small sample is punched out, leaving a pinhole in the paper. The ink is then dissolved, and by using liquid chromatography, the colors are compared with a standard library of inks. The imprint made by the individual typewriter keys can be used to compare with a library of typewriter fonts. The watermark on the paper can often be found and dated. Sometimes we can even see through the blacked out areas and decipher the hidden words. During the authentication process of the Eisenhower briefing document, Stan Friedman went to the National Archives and in the presence of an archivist found in their files what's known as the Cutler Twining Memo, which mentions MJ-12, MJ-12 Special Studies Group. We have an original onion skin paper with the appropriate watermarks, original declassification markings, it is a hard, physical, testable piece of paper. It's in a secure facility at our National Archives in College Park, Maryland. This declassified document seems to provide proof that MJ-12 was a reality, even though the government has never acknowledged its existence. So after you use these question document techniques, to the best of your ability, it turns out that the documents almost speak for themselves as being genuine. If the majestic documents are real, they provide new insight into perhaps the most closely guarded secret in the history of the world, a secret that has been fiercely protected for a very long time. I think that uh, government secrecy, classifying this information at what amounts to an above top secret level, was absolutely warranted in 1947 and maybe earlier because I think all this business got started um, perhaps during the Second World War. It is the recommendation of the President's special panel with concurrence from Majestic 12 that a policy of strict denial of the events surfacing from Roswell, New Mexico, and any other incident of such caliber, be enforced. An interactive program of controlled releases to the media, in such fashion to discredit any civilian investigation, be instituted in accordance with the provisions of the 1947 National Security Act. Certainly in 1947, the government could not afford to tell the world they could not afford to say, look, there are these alien spacecraft penetrating our airspace. We don't know where they're from, what they want, or how they operate, but we thought you'd like to know. That would have been totally irresponsible. There's no question it was justified at the time until they had answers. I think it's quite possible that much secrecy is due to the fact that the authorities do not have all the answers, that they cannot be certain from a day-to-day -day basis or even a year-to-year -year basis, whatever, as to precisely what is going on. By the mid-1960s, the government's apparent interest in UFOs was waning, but a rash of new sightings of unexplained lights and moving objects reignited the debate. We are being observed by some type of device which is ahead of us, far ahead of us, and is probably controlled by a highly advanced superior civilization. Now, this is a conclusion which I personally have stated and is shared by some members of our Board of Governors and advisors, not all of them. But it has reached the point where many people in the Air Force have the same conclusion. In fact, the Air Force at one time had a top secret estimate that these things were interplanetary spaceships. Based on what is known of the technology and intelligence of the visitors, 
it is fairly certain that there will be other sightings and encounters of a spectacular nature. As to the purpose and modus operandi, we are not certain, but it is clear that if these visitors had conquest in mind, it would not be difficult for them, given their ability to penetrate our airspace at will. I think that now it's evolved into a more multi-layered problem, uh, part of it dealing with uh, high technology projects and keeping them secure. If they tell the public a few things, there would be a clamor for more information that might uh, jeopardize the security of these programs. Another problem is that the fact that they've covered it up so long would create a sort of backlash against the, the government and the intelligence establishment. If these documents show a long, systematic, highly articulated process for handling UFO-related information, for sequestering that information, for marshalling it here and there, and for keeping everybody else out of the loop, completely unaware the structure that caused that to occur is a phenomenon in world history. I think the MJ-12 documents are extraordinarily important. Probably the most important government documents ever leaked to the public because they make clear, if they're genuine, that the United States has known that aliens are visiting Earth, that they are not perfect, obviously at least one crashed, and we have been taking measures to try to learn as much as we could from the wreckage and to try to understand what's going on. Why on earth would they have kept it secret? The discovery of extraterrestrial life, the greatest discovery in the history of man. The main reason, of course, is still a valid reason today, and that is to make sure that our enemies, namely in those days, the Soviet Union, did not get the technology. The technology was the driver. In addition, the reason for keeping it secret is to not let the public know that we really couldn't control our airspace. With urgent speed, the jet fighters rush to get in the air. Every second counts. They must be able to intercept the mystery plane before it can reach a target and drop its bomb. One example of technology discussed in the documents is a, is a report, an analytical report, from the Research and Development Laboratory dated 2 September 1947, where it has an early description of fiber optics, in essence, and it says... Flight instruments and controls are activated by optical waveguide fibers, similar to glass rods, except they are flexible and have a plastic cladding wrap. This cladding wrap is sort of the key breakthrough in fiber optics that allows increased signal to noise. Now here, this is a guy talking and describing fiber optics in 1947. One of the documents that was particularly exciting is uh, document that was done at the end of the summer of 1947, prepared and approved by Lieutenant General Nathan Twining. This included the results of what our scientists and engineers had been able to evaluate and determine uh, during the summer. And one of the things that really strikes me is a description that talks about a series of fine grid light lines connecting a series of dots in pure silver. This is very close to a description of an integrated circuit today. One interesting thing about the craft itself, it, it, it carried no fuel. There was no fuel. It was, they assumed that it was propelled by a series of cells, octagon-shaped cells underneath the craft itself, which indicates that evidently they were grafting energy from the atmosphere some way. That is one, one of the areas that they haven't discovered or haven't found out yet. As far as this idea of reverse engineering a crashed or captured spacecraft. Uh, I would hope that's been done. Uh, I'd hate to think that something has been sitting there longer than the lifetime of most of the people who will see this program and nothing's been done to it. Uh, the potential for learning is astounding and not attempting to reverse engineer it would be unthinkable. The YB-49 flying wing makes its maiden flight. This is the shape of things to come. Well, what if in the last five years we've developed new techniques for monitoring vehicles in the sky? We've got stealth aircraft, maybe the other guy will have stealth aircraft. Uh, should that be made public? 
And if we use those techniques to monitor flying saucers, should that be made public? Should the secrecy continue now? I've never been an advocate for putting everything on the table, especially technology. I have mixed feelings about what the government should do about covering up the truth about flying saucers. I would like the government to stand up, take away the ridicule that's been heaped on a lot of people. So a government announcement would bring forth a tremendous amount of data. Are these documents authentic and is their narrative real? I believe that there are four possibilities. One, of course, is that they are frauds created uh, as, as a hoax by uh, a, a gifted amateur. The second possibility is that they are officially constructed disinformation, uh, perhaps created decades ago uh, for the purposes of Cold War uh, misinformation for some kind of geopolitical purpose. The third possibility is that uh, the narrative is a mixture of fact and fiction. And then the fourth possibility, of course, is that they are authentic, genuine, leaked documents that uh, describe some remarkable events concealed from the history books. The concept that we are not alone in the universe has captivated many since the beginning of mankind. Throughout history, artists have included flying objects in their paintings, like this one from 17th century painter and protege of Rembrandt, Art de Gelder. Today, believers outnumber skeptics three to two. People around the world continue to report UFO sightings, but proof of extraterrestrial contact remains elusive. If the MJ-12 documents are genuine, the story they tell is astounding. If and when this story is brought to light, what impact will it have on our destiny? Philosophically speaking, I have to say that we're moving rapidly into a different kind of world in which the possibility of life from elsewhere is increasingly non-alarming. Our space exploration is bringing us to the point where we're ready to explore the outer planets and probably within a century uh, go outside of our solar system altogether. So it's, it's time that all of this is exposed for the sake of science, for the sake of the stability of our government, for the sake of civilization itself. I've steeped myself in flying saucer information for more than 40 years. I worked on classified government-sponsored programs. It's clear that there has been an organized effort to discredit every aspect of the UFO phenomenon. These documents are no exceptions. If they're genuine, they're of extraordinary importance for all of mankind. If, in fact, we have recovered uh, an extraterrestrial spacecraft uh, sometime in the past 50 years, uh, then, of course, we are in possession of definitive evidence that we are not alone. One of my heroes in life, Carl Sagan, uh, was fond of saying, on the day that we do discover that we're not alone, our society may begin to evolve and transform in some incredible and wondrous new ways. That's a day to look forward to, I believe. <laughs>